Hey, founders, welcome back to another episode of the Gab Lab. This is a show that's designed to bring you financial intelligence to not only blow your mind, but to help you build your bottom line. Today's episode, championed by our good friends at Community Future Sunrise, an office in Southeast Saskatchewan that's helping founders out there build their business and nail their numbers. I'm your show host, Tanya Woods Richardson, and today's episode is all about brand and its impact on the bottom line. We are joined in the lab by uh, Nail the Numbers Pro, Ryan Townen. Ryan is the founder and CEO of William Joseph, phenomenal and fun marketing agency that is servicing uh, companies across Canada, doing some phenomenal work. And he's going to walk us through what is a brand, how do we build a brand, and how do we deliver on the promise of a brand, all in an effort to build our bottom line. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the lab. Okay, Ryan, so happy to have you here. Thank you for joining me and investing the time to have this talk today. You betcha. Ah, So um, this is a little different from the normal conversations that we typically have in the Gab Lab, because normally we're talking all about money and profitability and pricing and cost of goods. And so I think everybody's happy to have a little reprieve from that. But before we get into the fun stuff, because I think a lot of founders love marketing and love branding, can we chat a little bit about why brand is so important to the bottom line? What is the correlation between branding and and bottom line profitability? Yeah, so... To kind of like articulate what brand is in our idea or in our mind at William Joseph, brand is all about the promise and the experience that you make to a customer. So it's more than just a logo and it's more than colors and it's more than the content in a website. It's really that whole idea of what is your story? And the thing is, is the more concise you can get your story, the more articulate, the more uh, defined so that it's authentic, compelling and different. Uh, it will really help you stand out amongst the crowd, right? So when you stand out amongst the crowd, competitors uh, will start, you'll start differentiating and then customers will be able to easily see who's the best fit for them. And when you can make that connection, that's what helps close a sale. Without a brand, people buy on the what. What do you sell? Okay, I sell this. What do you sell? Oh, it's the same thing. Well, who's cheaper? Grind it down. But without the why and without the brand and without the story that differentiates you, people might not be able to understand what's different from you and the bottom line price person. And you know what, that could cost you sales or turn it into a price war. So having a very strategic brand can definitely help, um, you know, again, build market awareness, help you close deals and stand out amongst the crowd. Oh, brilliant. And so many points that I want to dive into there, but the big, and and we will, that's why we have the time here together. The big thing that I I took away from that is about differentiating yourself and then being able to close the deal. Because as you said, I think a lot of founders get stuck in their pricing strategy and trying to price based on what Joe down the block is pricing at, and then getting stuck in this, you know, in this vortex of not making enough money and trying to, to figure out how to make, uh, create that key differentiator. So I love that you've touched on those. So thank you for that. So we're going to dive into a couple of things today, thankfully, with you here, and you've given me permission to, to go forward in this, in this Real space. Me. Woohoo! Uh, so we're going to talk about the uh, the visual representation of the brand. And then we're going to, in part two, we're going to talk a little bit about I love it. The experience, the promise of the brand. I think a lot of people forget about that. And the third piece, we're going to talk about pricing and products and how this brand needs to kind of weave throughout all of the all of the different products that you uh, that you create and put out on the market. So one of the things that I was thinking of when I was thinking of brand is from a high level kind of visual representation, I was thinking about personality. And this is why I reached out to you, because I have to tell you, Ryan, what you have built like I remember when we first connected, it was, it was a while ago, it was over 20 yeah. years ago when you first built William Joseph and William Joseph, when I think of personality, I think of you and I think of William Joseph and you've done such an incredible job with that agency and the support that you've shown business owners really across Canada, right? Mm-hmm. Started out in Calgary and then Western Canada. So I just, I just want to take a moment to, to thank you for the work that you do. 
Um, and so now let's talk a little bit about the, the brand that you've managed to accomplish with, with William Joseph and what William Joseph stands for and the, the personality piece, the visual representation, what goes in to the brand? What do you have to be aware of when you're first kind of building that brand? Those are a lot of points too. Now you threw at me, you know, when I started this company uh, almost 20 years ago, my whole thought was, I'm not a small company on day one. I'm just the beginning of a big story. Oh. And I truly believe at the end of the day, your mindset is what's going to shape your success in business and in life. So when clients come in to see me, I can tell who's going to grow and who's going to be successful by their, by how they talk. You know, when we hit up to be a $5 million company with this, and, you know, they have this vision and they have this attitude that anything is possible. And that's what I had. I truly believe, I didn't believe it couldn't happen. Of course it's going to happen. And I thought big. And my, like, so now 20 years later, my marketing budget is bigger than my annual sales up until like year four. <laughs> so it does happen if you think it can make it. So I want to start there. So please do understand your shape, your, your thoughts shape your reality in business and in your life. So the bigger you think, the bigger you'll achieve. So that's number one. I think when it comes to being your personality, I just say, let yourself shine. That's it. You know what? Everybody has a set of values. I have a set of values. You have a set of values. Every company that we encounter has a set of values. And there's this personality that's, that's who they are. And there's certain customers that will fit with that. And there's certain customers that won't. And that's okay. We're not everybody's cup of tea. But the thing that I do want you to know is good branding is just authentically showing that shine. It's telling your story so that the world can see it. It's like amplifying it. So that, you know, not only do your customers know who you are, but the people down the road or down the street or down across the country, they get to see who you are. So I think what happens is, is when you try to whitewash a brand or neutralize it, it loses your personality. And that's the whole thing is you're trying to find people that fit you. So at WJ, people are always like, well, you're so authentic. So I, I don't know how to be anyone else but me. So I just, I just tell my story and our company attracts the same, like a, a talent and a, a group of people that embrace this culture. Because see, this is a whole thing. Your culture is your brand. And we're going to talk later about experience. But your brand is really that promise and the story that you're going to go and set forth and tell the world. But your people have to support that, right? So if they're not in alignment with the story that you told, people would think that maybe they were in the wrong place because it just the story doesn't fit the people. Um, when you talk about... So anyways, that's the WJ thing. We, yeah. We've been resilient. We have seen ups and downs and ups and downs and... Oh my God, now I have recessions and pandemics and I, I don't know. I think there's a resilience that we folks from out West have. Uh, the Prairie folks, we're, we're pretty hard workers and we just keep going. But, you know, I think there's this entrepreneurial spirit that's always lived in me. And that's re what really resonates through a lot of our clients that we work with. They see me in the trenches and they're like, oh God, that guy's slugging and he's making it. I, maybe he can help us. So there's, there's, under, there's undercurrents or themes in your brand too, like resilience, entrepreneurship, like there's those aspects that come up. So yeah, out of curiosity, yeah. Yeah, yes, there's, um, there's a lot there. Thank you. And so out of curiosity, knowing that the majority of this audience is going to be founders, and let's just say many of them are in the, in the, at the point where they're either reinventing themselves or they're starting from scratch now through this pandemic. And they're trying to figure out their brand and their personality. As a founder, do you, do you, do you go within and do you start with you and your personal values and personality and then want to have that reflected in the business? Or do you do it the other way? What is the business going to stand for? And what personality does the business have? What is your recommendation on that? That's a great question. So like going forward, like the I and we gets kind of messy when you right. own the company, right? So are you the company? Is the company you or is it different? So I have a personal brand and William Joseph has a brand. So when we talk about the company, what does the company stand for? Why does it exist? And then what is the essence, the values, the personality of that company? What is the key messaging and the language and X, Y, Z? So you build out the story. 
And then you take that story and you go, okay, so think of a book. You've crafted this beautiful story. Now it needs to have imagery that goes with it. So if you're very compassionate as a, as a company, then you would use colors that would reflect compassion. If you're very techy, very, very techy, I can see clean lines and sharp and white because that would represent technology. So the graphics and the design has to mirror the story. So when you read a book, it's all consistent, right? The pictures match the words. That's right. the same thing with branding. Uh, the pictures match the words, which then matches the experience that a person would have. Oh, okay. I love that. Okay, so it's starting to come together for me. So you start with the words, you start with the story. You have a story for the founder. You have a story for the business. They don't always need to overlap. They, they can be different stories. Because you think about this, I could own eight companies and those eight companies could each have their own brand and their right. own, each client base, right? right? I'm still the same founder, right? So, so the point is, is you're going to have your personal brand and story and you'll have your own personal LinkedIn and you'll post your personal content and then your companies will each have a brand. Gotcha. Okay. So words first, founder, business, images come next. And to that point, this is where you're talking about the colors that you're using, the imagery that you're using, the lines, the shapes, all of that, that that visual representation all comes together. And then the experience, which we talk about in the next piece. I guess I have one more question going back to founder and business, because you talked about authenticity. So how do you, when you start putting words around the brand of a business, if it's incongruent with well, I guess maybe I'm answering my own question, but if it's incongruent with uh, a founder's values or founder's personality, let's say, for example, the business is supposed to be outgoing and out there and in your face and dramatic and the founder or the team are all introverts and they like to be behind the scenes, making everything happen. Do, do you need to make sure there's some congruency between the team and the brand or is it possible to do a workaround and just find a different framework for it? Mm. I think we'll kind of separate that question. Okay. So again, it takes a, a, a diverse team to run any company, right? So it takes some doers and it takes some leaders and it takes some thinkers and it takes some experts of all sorts. So we're going to like it, like even in William Joseph, where we have a very vibrant culture, which is really dynamic. We have like an, an equal number of different types of personalities that make this spin because they each add value in their own way. When we look at the brand of a company, it's really talking about like what makes it different than the rest, what makes it authentic. And sometimes that's pulling a few attributes from the founders. You're pulling a few attributes from the staff. And you're saying, you know, when you look at like William Joseph overall, these are the things that come to mind. And some of that will be from the experiences that our clients have had. Some will be from what our staff brings. Like they're super smart. They're brainiacs. They bring that to the table. You know, maybe I do have that energy and enthusiasm. Maybe I bring that to, to the table. So collectively, the WJ experience will help define our brands or our values. And that's really what we take forward. So it's not okay. just me or just them. Um, yeah. Gotcha. I've oversimplified this process dramatically. Like it's actually a strategy session that we take clients through okay. where we help them define their why, help look at their values, start defining their essence, their personality, their key messaging and language. So it, it is a process you go through to, to pull that all out of a company. Beautiful, but that that's so valuable. It, it's that ladder. So the, the why, the values, the essence, the personality, the layering. So don't just yes. try to write the story right from, from scratch. Right. It's it's the layering process to understand the brand. And um, I know, Ryan, we'll, we'll be putting your information down in the show notes below. So if anybody wants to reach out and I know from the past, you've you've done amazing workshops with founders where, you know, if, if they can't afford the one on one that you've got workshops that people can access so they can get this experience as well. Sorry. So I just threw that out there. I hope you still do. <laughs> I didn't do my research. I, I do now. <laughs> <laughs> starting tomorrow <laughs> we'll figure it out we'll figure it out as we we'll go on the fly yes. just like a founder okay so i just want to talk about all the touch points the visual touch points of a brand i think that oftentimes we you know right away like you said it's the website it's the business card it's the logo that gets created and then where that's going to be shared um 
I think of all the social media and you're a king at social media. I mean, I watch you on LinkedIn and your engagement on your posts and you spoke to that authenticity. And I think that's a big piece of why your engagement is so high. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that brand just resonates through, through everything, even your personal brand on LinkedIn. Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, like I said, we can post a picture of dogs. I tell, I tell my clients, don't, pick, don't post dog pictures. And then there I go posting dog pictures <laughs> that get thousands and thousands of views. Um, you know what I think the whole, like, again, um, there's a lot of questions in that one. So like, I, let's just talk about LinkedIn for one second. We're just being highly random here. I think any platform that you become a part of, you have to stand out amongst the crowds. Remember I said a brand has to be authentic, compelling, and differentiating. A LinkedIn or social media experience has to be authentic, compelling, and differentiating. So, you know, I could have just been there, shared some articles, and did things like everybody else. And honestly, I wouldn't have stood out from the crowd. And, and that's how I started. I hated that platform. I was like, oh, shit, I don't want to go on there. I don't have time. And then my staff were like many, many years ago, you have to be on there. It's where business owners go. Okay, so off I went. And I was like, I don't wanna say anything because I don't wanna sound stupid. Long story short, I started to share things and then I started to post and here we are today, right? So you start developing a following and people like to follow your story. And I think what makes me maybe stand out a little bit is I'm always trying to be um, educational. So I'm trying to teach people something. I'm trying to be inspirational to give them the, the strength and courage to go on the next day. And I try to entertain. Like the world's a tough place. And my I'm kind of a funny guy. So my personality yeah. is to, uh, to joke around and stuff. So I want to keep things lighthearted a little bit because that's authentically me, right? So yeah. those are my pillars on, on social. Well, you've done a you've done a great job with it, and I think it's um, you're you're an amazing example of how your personal brand weaves in with the corporate brand because you you do tie in your I mean your your business is your life right but you're never selling anything on there and you're never speaking the the you're never towing the corporate line just like you said it is always inspirational and educational and entertaining at the same time so thanks for setting that example um, okay. Uh, last piece here that I want to ask about before we start to move in to the brand uh, promise. When, when do we know that it's time to either rebrand or to, uh, to actually shape a brand? Is there a good time to do it other than at the very beginning? Or if we've been towing the corporate line for so long, how do we know that it's actually time to freshen things up a little bit? That's a great question. So I think it's all about being relevant. So when you think of a founder, who can better sell the company but a founder? They have passion, they have knowledge, they could get in that room and close a deal. But we can't be everywhere, can we? So our brand has to go out into the world and tell our story when we're not there. The moment you feel your brand is not telling the story as well as you could, it's time to address it. It's your little remote sales force out there telling wow. your story. And you need to sit back and think like, is it, is it current? Is it up to date? A lot of times people don't address their brand and it looks really dated. Well, I wouldn't send a salesperson from 10 years, 10 years ago to sell my company. So why am I telling a, a 10 year old brand to go out there to sell my company? It's out of date. Um, number two, especially like if you start going into new markets, like we have clients up, up in Grand Prairie that are now going into Houston. Well, the brand worked in Grand Prairie. It does not work in Houston. It feels too small. It's like a little town brand. And it had to be a little town brand because if it was more than that, people would have been like, who the hell do you think you guys are poising like this big company? Right. But as you grow, then you need to start being sensitive to new regions. Or like as you diversify, I think that's a huge time when people have to rebrand. Like you can think of like Ryan's Plumbing Company, Ryan's Plumbing and Heating Company, Ryan's plumbing, heating, and electric. Okay, at some point, it's Ryan's home services, right? Like we have to, you can't keep putting commas on this. It's going to look ridiculous. So I think, you know, my advice to a founder is this. If you feel your brand is out of date and it's not current or as good as the stuff that you do, rebrand. Number two, if you're going into new markets and you're adding new services, rebrand um, or evolve brand. I'm going to interchange those two. And number three, like if you bought the company from like your parents and you want to put your imprint, you want to imprint it with you, do it. 
you know, mom and dad had a way of doing it. And now you're going to have a new way of doing it. And I think you'll have a lot more pride if you kind of make it your own than trying to live in the legacy of your parents. Learn from your parents and learn from legacy. But like now it's time to go to the future. Right? Beautiful, beautiful, great tips there. So just to reiterate, as we kind of close down this first part of understanding, um, understanding the brand is I think what's so important here is that a lot of founders love to move right away to the color and the fonts and what's a logo going to look like. What I really took away from this, Ryan, is understand your story. Understand the story, understand the why, understand the, you know, the, the, the value proposition, the essence, the personality, put words around it first and understand what that's supposed to convey. And then the, the images and the visual elements of it, the fonts and the colors, put that on second. And then what I think is so key about, as we talked about um, uh, the rebrand and your, your word evolving is making sure that every one of these touch points is telling that story. Because I think so many founders, they get into a brand without even telling the story. So I would, you probably have a better idea what these numbers are, but I would guess like seven out of 10 founders right now don't even know what their story is, right? Seven out of 10 founders will list what they do. Yes. And they will put that out as what their, their brand. And it's like, they will feel that business comes to them from their reputation and from their sales folks and from word of mouth. That's typically how it goes. And so they've never seen the power of branding. Um, so one person said to me, we've never got sales from our website. Do we even need one? And, and I quickly corrected and I said, well, we've never got sales. You've never got sales from that website. Um, and there's a reason for that, right? So it's, it's challenging because you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of people trying to sell you stuff. So who do you trust? And I think at the end of the day, you have to build a brand that people trust, right? So people trust me, they trust my company. So when I give them advice, they kind of go, oh, is this true? Do I really need this damn stuff? Yes, you need this stuff. I can yes. show you why and I'll take you on this journey and I'll hold your hand. And then they go, okay, I, I feel comfortable. So like it's, it's, I think the other thing like we talked about at the beginning is, you know, successful company, also have to um, be willing to learn. And I think be open-minded and see what data shows and stuff. Because if you get really stuck in your ways, the world of marketing has changed so much in three years. Three years. A marketing plan today would look nothing like a marketing plan three years ago. Now imagine you haven't addressed your brand or marketing for five years. You're spending money right. on things that don't even work anymore. So that's like pouring, like, like, like literally having the most uh, gas guzzling vehicle out on the, on the road from the eighties. And you're trying to motor when these hybrids are zooming right past you and you're not willing to change. Right. Yeah. So adaptability and change is something that is a mindset of a leader as well. So smart. So smart, Ryan. Thank you for all that. I did, you know, talking about money here just for a second on this money podcast, it's like pricing, right? Where people don't change their price for three or four years. And meanwhile, inflation is adding up 2% year over year over year. And you're wondering why everybody's wondering why that bottom line isn't working. Okay. Awesome stuff, Ryan. Thank you so much. Um, so everybody, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to see you in here for part two. We're actually going to get to the promise of the brand. And this is really the customer experience that, that um, as Ryan's talking about, the authenticity, you have to be able to not only show it, but deliver on it. So come back in here for part two, just a shout out to our episode champion, Community Futures Sunrise. Thank you for all that you do. And Ryan, thank you again so much for being here. Looking forward to seeing you in part two.